Welcome back to Deep Learning. And today we want to discuss a little more architectures and in particular the really deep ones. So here we are really going towards deep learning. Instead of what humans might need, just dozens of examples, these things will need millions. If you want to train deeper models with all the things that we've seen so far, you see that we go into a certain kind of saturation. If you want to go deeper, then you just add layers on top and you would hope that the training error would go down. But if you look very carefully, you can see that the 20 layer network has a lower training error and also a lower test set error than for example a 56 layer model. So we cannot just increase the layers and layers and layers and hope that things get better. Because it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> and this effect is not just caused by overfitting. We are building layers on top, so there must be other reasons. And it's likely that it's reasons that are related to the vanishing gradient problem. Maybe one reason could be the relus or the initialization or the problem of the internal covariate shift where we try then batch normalization, ELUs and CELUs, but we still have a problem with the poor propagation of activations and gradients. And we see that if we try to build those very deep models, we get problems with vanishing gradients and we can't train the early layers, which even results in worse results on the training set. So I have one solution for you, and these are residual units. Residual units are a very cool idea. So what they propose to do is not learn the direct mapping f of x, but instead we learn the residual mapping. So we want to learn h of x, and h of x is the difference between f of x and x. So we could also express it in a different way, and this is actually then how it's implemented, that you compute your network f of x as some layer h of x plus x. So the trainable part is now essentially in a side branch, and the side branch is h of x, that's the trainable one, and on the main branch we have just some x plus the side branch that will deliver our estimate y. In the original implementation of residual blocks, there was still a difference. It was not exactly like we had it on the previous slide. So we had the side branch where we have a weighting layer, batch normalization, relu, weights, another batch normalization, then the addition, and then another nonlinearity, the relu, for one residual block. And this was later then changed into using batch norm, relu weight, batch norm, relu weight for the residual block. And it turned out that uh, this kind of configuration was more stable. And we essentially have the identity that is backpropagated on the plus branch. So this is very nice because we can then propagate the gradient back into the early layers just with this addition and we get a much more stable backpropagation this way. This then brings us to a complete residual network. So we cut it at the bottom and show the bottom part on the right hand side. And this is a comparison between VGG, the 43 layer plane network and the 43 layer residual network. And you can see that there's essentially these skip connections that are being introduced that allow us to skip over this step or then backpropagate into the respective layers. There's also downsampling involved, and then, of course, the skip connections also have to be downsampled, so this is why we have dotted connections at these positions. And we can see that VGG has some 19.6 billion flops, while our plane ResNet has only 3.6 billion flops, so it's also more efficient. Now let's put this to the test and we can now see that already in the 34 layer case we don't get the error rates as we would like to have them with very deep networks. So the error is higher than if we only use an 18 layer network. 
But if we introduce the residual connections, we can see that we get a benefit and get reduced error rates. So the residual connections help us to get more stable gradients and we can now get the training and the validation error lower with going deeper. There's different variants of the residual block networks. There's the standard building block. And here on the right hand side, you can see that we can also use the bottleneck idea by downsampling, then doing the convolutions and then upsampling again, which is the kind of bottleneck version of the residual block. So we can combine this with the other recipes that we have learned so far. And if we do that, we can see that we can even train networks with 152 layers and this then produced in 2015 one of the first networks that actually beat human performance. The humans are a low bar to exceed. Remember all the things that we said about human performance in particular if you only have one labeler. So actually you would have to have more labeler and but what we can see here is that we really go into the range of the human performance and this is a very nice result. People have been asking why do these resonance work so well and a very interesting interpretation is the so-called ensemble view of resonance. So here you can see that if we build resonant layers or resonant blocks on top of each other, we can see that we can break this down into a kind of recursion. So if we have x3 equals to x2 plus the h3 x2, we can now resubstitute and see that this is equal to x1 plus h2 of x1 plus h3 of x1 plus h2 of x1. And we can substitute again and see that we actually compute x0 plus h1 of x0 plus h2 of x0 plus h1 of x0 plus h3 of x0 plus h1 of x0 plus h2 of x0 plus h1 of x0. Wow, very cool trick. This is something that you may want to remember if somebody is going to test you for whatever unknown reason about your knowledge on deep learning. So I really would recommend having a close look at this slide. So we see in the interpretation that we are essentially constructing ensembles of our more shallow residual classifiers. So we could say that our classifier trained from the ResNet is essentially building a very strong ensemble. So this is very nice. And we see that in a classical feedforward network, we can change the representation in every single layer, yeah? because we have essentially this matrix multiplication in there. And the matrix multiplication has the property that it can convert into a completely different domain. Of course, we are building on all these um, great abstractions that people have invented over the millennia, such as matrix multiplications. So essentially, in the classical feedforward network, we have one single path and we have at neuron level many different paths of the same length. In the residual networks, we get two to the power of n paths and at neuron layer, we get many different paths of varying length going through different subsets of the layers, which is a very strong ensemble that is constructed this way. We can also change our viewpoint and think about the residual networks and the fully connected ones that we've seen earlier. And in the fully connected layers, you can essentially change the complete representation. So we are trying to show this here in A, B and C. So A would be just one conversion from one domain into another. And if we now unroll this, we can see that the residual network is essentially doing a gradual change over the different successions. So we see that we have a slight change and then the color gradually changes towards blue, where we have the desired representation in the very end. If we compare this to fully connected layers, like in C, we can have a completely different representation in the first layer, followed by a completely different 
representation in the second layer. And lastly, we finally map onto the desired representation in the last layer. So in the classical fully connected ones, we can produce a completely new representation in every layer. And this means that they also become very dependent because the representation needs to be matching in order to do the further processing. So we can do a very interesting experiment like a, a lesion study as you would do in a biological neural network. And here's some results with uh, stochastic depth. So the idea is now that we turn off entire layers and we can turn off complete layers and it doesn't destroy the classification that is done by the ResNet, which is pretty cool. So if you just turn off like 10% of the layers, then you can see that we have a reduction in performance, but it doesn't break down. And the more layers I'm reducing, the worse the performance gets. But because we have this slight change of representation, we can knock off individual steps and it doesn't completely destroy this network. So this is of course also a hint that we somehow are right with this ensemble representation and this gradual change. We will later in this class show that the ResNet can also be interpreted as a kind of gradient descent procedure. And this is of course because we, if we follow a gradient descent, then we have this gradual change from every position and we are constructing essentially something similar with the ResNet. We can actually show that the ResNet configuration can also be determined if you seek to optimize an unknown loss function and you want to train this gradient and you will exactly come up with a ResNet solution. But this will take a bit of time and we will talk about this towards the end of this class. So far these networks have been built really really deep. There is even 1200 layers possible even on CIFAR 10. So that's a very interesting result. So we see that we are really going towards very deep networks. I don't think that having more depth in the network in the sense of instead of 100 layers we have 10,000 is going to solve our problem. So what else could we talk about? Well next time in deep learning we want to talk about the rise of residual connections and a couple of more tricks that help you build really effective deep networks. So I hope you enjoyed this video and tune in for the next one. Bye bye.